Good, uh, good evening. Thank you uh, for joining us here at the Atwood Museum for our lecture series on this beautiful fall evening. Um, I'm Kevin Wright. I'm the executive director of the Atwood Museum, and we're glad you could join us for this lecture this evening. Uh, before we get started, I just want to talk about a few um, housekeeping items coming up at the museum. Uh, the Abbott Museum has reduced its hours uh, to Fridays and Saturdays, one to four, uh, for the remainder of the month. Uh, and uh, the museum will be closed for the month of November, uh, but we will uh, once again be open um, on Fridays and Saturdays uh, when we get in December until about Christmas. Uh, so I look forward to uh, seeing all that information will be on our website. Uh, this is an exciting month for us as we got Halloween at the Batwood is, is back. And that will be happening on Saturday, uh, uh, October 30th. If you have young children or grandchildren that want to join us for our um, trick or treat parade through the museum, uh, it's a great event for them to come and, and join us. Uh, we have uh, six different opportunities for them to sign up on our website. So please make reservations on our website uh, and then they can come in for the indoor uh, parade and there'll be uh, outside uh, activities as well a very good fun family event. So we look forward to that. Um, in, uh, in November, where our annual bake sale will return on Tuesday, November 23rd, two days before Thanksgiving. Uh, Pre-order pies are now available on our website uh, and there will be plenty of other baked goods available uh, the day of the event at the museum. Uh, we'll probably be open, I believe, at nine o'clock in the morning uh, and it will be, uh, Everything will be open until uh, the big goods sell out. Uh, so please check our website for more details over the coming weeks and uh, uh, make sure to help us with one of our big uh, fundraising events of the year. Our next virtual lecture will take place on Tuesday, November 16th at 5 p.m. Life in Glass uh, with wine educator Camille broderick Rodier. Uh, uh, a little bit different than our normal uh, lectures and we're really looking forward to that lecture. So if you uh, are a uh, a wine connoisseur and want to find out some more information about that, uh, please join us for that uh, uh, virtual lecture uh, on the 16th of November. Uh, following the end of this um, meeting, uh, our speaker will uh, answer any questions. So if you have any questions, uh, please make sure to, uh, uh, to put your questions in the Q&A field uh, at the bottom of your screen uh, in Zoom, and uh, we will get those questions over to our speaker and he will answer to you. Uh, and so let me uh, introduce our speaker for today. Andrew Singer is a writer and speaker on China, a traveler, history lover, and collector of books in Chinese snuff bottles who lives on Cape Cod. His lecture, Sailing to Cathay, explores the vibrant maritime trade routes that link Europe and Asia before and after the European arrived directly on the Asian shores at the turn of the 16th century. It's my pleasure to introduce to you, uh, Andrew Singer. Thank you. Good afternoon. Can, can you all hear me? Oh, wonderful. I, I apologize. I'm having a little bit of a technical difficulty here, but if you can hear me, that is wonderful. Um, I'm very happy to be here today, and thank you, Kevin, and uh, the uh, Chatham Historical Society to, for inviting me to Tuesdays at the Atwood. Um, I am going to uh, share my screen. If you will bear with me. Uh, oh. Okay, this is one of those days where things are not going as planned. Um, <laughs> can you all see the screen at this point? I'm trying to do, I do apologize. I am having trouble. I'm having technical issues here.
Can I ask is if someone could answer in chat? It, it, can you see my screen at this point? Okay, thank you. I apologize. Um, um, I am here to speak with you about sailing to Cathay today. And as the 15th century came to a close, uh, Europeans sailed directly to Asia for the first time and came into widespread contact with cultures and civilizations that were home to a vibrant and well-developed maritime trade system. The Portuguese were the first to arrive, followed by the Spanish, Dutch, English, French, and others, as European countries slowly became dominant in large areas of the world far beyond their shores. There were European travelers and merchants to the wider world prior to the 15th century, but they were the exception, not the rule. This is not to say that the Europeans prior to the 15th and 16th centuries did not know about Asia. Asian products were already in demand in Middle Ages Europe. These included Chinese silk, tea, and porcelain, Southeast Asian spices, aromatics, and hardwoods, and Indian textiles, peppers, iron, and diamonds. Knowledge of China in Asian societies, customs, philosophies, and political structures, incomplete or inaccurate though they were, were already not unheard of on the continent. The ancient overland silk trade, silk road trade routes account for some of this commerce and communication, but even more came from merchant traders who brought products, information, and news back and forth on the seas from India in points east through the Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea to ports in Arabia, the Mediterranean, and beyond. So why did the Europeans not travel directly to Asia? before the 15th century. They wanted to. Cutting out the middlemen on luxury goods would save money and increase profits, as well as yield more access and more control. But getting there was not that easy. The Mediterranean Sea did not provide a direct water connection to the Indian Ocean. The routes through Arabia, the Persian Gulf, and the Red Sea were controlled by others. And much of Europe at the time did not still believe that there was a water connection elsewhere to Asia. The blame for this latter point, if blame is due, may, all go, may go all the way back to Ptolemy. In approximately 150 CE, Claudius Ptolemy, an Egyptian, an Egyptian astronomer and geographer, made this map of the known world when he was at the Library of Alexandria. And if you can see my cursor, um, he showed along the southern part of this map a large landmass that was extending from Africa on the left and the west all the way to Asia on the east. And in effect, he was showing the Indian Ocean here as a lake. It was totally enclosed. In the 12th century, the great Arab geographer, Al-Sharif al, al DC also prepared a world map showing the land mass also extending from Africa towards Asia. But as many Islamic map makers did at the time, he positioned the world with south at the top. And so on this map here, what you see on the lower right is what we would call an upside down Europe. The Mediterranean Sea is above it. China and Asia are off to the far left of this map. And then you have this large land mass at the top, which extends from Africa over to Asia. The three circles that you see are representative of the, so of the source of the Nile River connected to a mountain deep in the heart of Africa. This was Al Idrisi's version of the world at that time. 300 years later on still, near the end of the 15th century, Francisco Berlingieri made this map of the world. It was a grand map and he continued to show along the Southern part here and he labeled it here, terra incognita. And he was showing again, a land mass connecting Africa all the way to Asia with the Indian Ocean still shown as a lake. This is much of the reason why many people in Europe did not think that the Indian Ocean was an open body of water. But although many people maybe didn't believe it, they were still looking for it. And by this time, many in Europe knew or suspected that there was a water connection through to the Indian Ocean. Now, searching for a direct route to Asia was one thing. However, this was not the original reason that the Portuguese 
were the first European sea ventures down the west coast of Africa. During the 15th century, while the Spanish sent Italian Cristoforo Colombo across the Atlantic Ocean, searching for the Spice Islands of Southeast Asia, Prince Henry the Navigator of Portugal and his successors sent ships to probe south down the northwest coast of Africa. Prince Henry was originally not looking to trade with Asia, but rather to trade with Africa. Europe needed gold and slaves, and Africa had an abundance of both. The continent was home to existing trade routes that Africans had pioneered on their west coast. Ports and people were ready to trade when the newcomers arrived. As for venturing further south down the African coast, there were other concerns beyond just the old Ptolemic view that one could not access the Indian Ocean that way. There were legends of the Torrid Zone, a region of lore that was reputedly so hot that no one could traverse it and survive. There were legends of sea monsters that destroyed ships that dared enter. For myriad reasons, there was an invisible point of no return line that European sailors feared for the longest time. By the late 15th century, however, the Portuguese were not only actively searching for this water route to Africa, but they were public about their intentions. In 1485, Portugal's ambassador to Rome delivered an oration of obedience from King Joao II to Pope Innocent VIII, in which the Portuguese gave an update on their explorations down the west coast of Africa and announced, incorrectly as it turns out later, that they had voyaged within mere days of proving the water connection to Asia. When Bartholomew Diaz briefly rounded the Cape of Good Hope in 1488 and returned to tell the tale, the Portuguese took the first tentative European steps into a maritime system that was well-established and well-traveled. Arab, Muslim, Jewish, as well as Indian and Christian traders had for centuries been plying the waters of the Indian Ocean and Arabian Sea from Southeast Asia and China in the east to Madagascar off the southeast coast of Africa in the West. The active trade route sailed from Saraf, Basra, Hormuz, and Aden in the Middle East over to the west coast of Africa, India, down and around India to Ceylon and the Andaman and Nicobar Islands, through the Malacca Strait between Sumatra and the Malay Peninsula, into Indonesia to the Spice Islands, and up past modern Vietnam to China and Japan. Established ports along the way allowed for trading to be conducted, repairs to be made, and water and supplies to be reprovisioned. Portuguese explorer Vasco da Gama tapped into this maritime system when he traveled to Calicut on the west coast of India in 1498. It was the first direct European voyage across the Indian Ocean. And here, he encountered the first of many Asian economic centers. In addition to India, there were powerful kingdoms further east, including the Srivijaya on the Sumatran side of the Malay archipelago and the Champa in what is now part of Vietnam. The people and societies of these kingdoms were integral parts of the maritime circuit and were long familiar with foreign traders and travelers when the winds blew the European newcomers to their shores. The monsoon winds in the Indian Ocean were key for they governed the maritime trade between Asia and Europe. Ships had to leave southern China in late autumn or winter before the northeast monsoon to take them south, west, and north. The same was true in the Persian Gulf at the other end of the trade route. As Edward Schaefer has written, quote, and even before the merchant vessels were leaving China, the ships of Islam were underway. If they left Basra or Saraf in September or October, they would be out of the Persian Gulf in time for the fair monsoon of winter to carry them across the Indian Ocean and could expect to catch the stormy southwest monsoon in June to carry them northward from Malaya across the South China Sea to their destinations in South China. The rule, both east and west, was southward in winter, northward in summer. The Chinese were also longstanding participants in the maritime world. Chinese maritime trade contact with Southeast Asia is measured in millennia. In the official Han Shu, which is the book of the former Han Dynasty, which was, which was written predominantly during the first century CE. It is recorded that Chinese vessels were visiting Sumatra, Burma, Ceylon, and southeastern India during the Western Han Dynasty. 
During the Tang Dynasty, Jia Dan, a scholar and official, described a sea route from Canton to Baghdad through the Malacca Straits, Indian Ocean, and Arabian Sea, with stops at Singapore, the Nicobar Islands, Ceylon, and India. During the early 13th century, some 50 years before the arrival of Marco Polo in China, a late Southern Song Dynasty government official based in the southern Chinese city, port city of Quanzhou, compiled the Gazetteer of Foreign Lands. In this, he detailed all the knowledge of faraway places known to the Chinese. The Gazetteer contains entries from cities and countries spread across Southeast Asia, South Asia, Arabia, and Eastern Africa of how kings, officials, and commoners lived and traveled, wore their hair, what they ate, how they acted, and the products they were known to trade in travel times. The reader traveled as far away in the Gazetteer as the Mediterranean Sea to see the shining lighthouse of Alexandria and to witness the mighty force of Sicily's Mount Etna. With the fall of the Song Dynasty and the rise of the Yun Dynasty in the late 13th century, Kublai Khan, the new emperor, sent armadas to invade Japan and to battle the Cham, the Annamese, and the Kadiri, kingdoms spread across Southeast Asia. Now, none of these military efforts were successful, but trade continued on unabated. For centuries before the arrival of the Europeans, the southern Chinese city of Quanzhou in what is now Fujian province across from Taiwan was China's principal connection with the world. Depending on your vantage point for maritime trade, cosmopolitan Quanzhou was either the beginning or the end of the line. Song Dynasty Quanzhou, all the way back in the year 1000, has been described by Professor Valerie Hansen as follows. The street is packed with customers buying pearl necklaces from Sri Lanka, ornaments carved from African ivory, perfumes preserved with stabilizers from Tibet and Somalia, vials crafted from Baltic amber, and furniture made from every imaginable aromatic wood. The smell of foreign incense permeates the air. A shop around the corner sells expensive and high-tech products alongside versions modified for local consumers. Depending on the holiday, Hindu, Muslim, or Buddhist worshipers join the throngs. About 300 years later, Marco Polo also described Quanzhou, he called it Zaitun, when he arrived in the, during the Yuan Dynasty in the late 13th centuries. Quote, at the end of five days journey from Fuju, you arrive at the noble and handsome city of Zaitun, which has a port famous for the vast quantity of shipping, loaded with merchandise that enters it and is afterward distributed through every part of the province of Manzi. The quantity of pepper imported there is so great that what is carried to Alexandria to supply the demand of the western parts of the world is trifling in comparison, perhaps not more than a hundredth part. It is indeed impossible to convey any idea of the number of merchants and the accumulation of goods in this place, which is held to be one of the largest ports in the world. It is estimated by the merchants that their costs, including customs and freight, amount to one half of the value of the cargo. And yet, their profit on the other half is so large that they are always happy to return with another stock of merchandise. The pinnacle of Chinese maritime activity took place between 1440, 1405 and 1433 during the Ming Dynasty with the seven ocean seas voyages of eunuch Admiral Zheng He. These voyages sailed with up to 27,000 soldiers and sailors on dozens to hundreds of ships. The most grand of these vessels were treasure ships that dwarfed anything previously seen. The treasure ships were by far the largest, most technologically sophisticated sailing ships to take to the oceans to that time, with waterproof compartmentalized hulls and mechanical stern post rudders. The fleets launched from port in Nanjing, China, on the Yangtze River and sailed out to the ocean and down the Chinese coast to Quanzhou, before they sailed across the South China Sea and down to the kingdom of Champa. From there, they crossed to Java and then passed through the Malacca Straits and the mighty Srivijaya Empire, before popping into the Indian Ocean and up to the Andamar and Nicobar Islands, then over to Ceylon. From Ceylon, they swung around the southern tip of India to ports at Calicut, Cochin and Goa on the Malabar coast. And after that, as shown here, it was a straight shot across the Arabian Sea to Hormuz and Aden and onto the northeast coast of Africa. 
If this route sounds familiar, though in reverse, it is. Like the Portuguese to come almost a century later, Zheng He was himself following long-established maritime trade routes. In all, Zheng He's fleets made dozens of repeated stops during each voyage in long-existing ports of call. There remains much debate about the purposes of Zheng He's voyages, and there is likely no one answer. These voyages were not of exploration, nor were they of conquest and colonization in the later European sense. Zheng He fought battles at times, and the threat of force and his mighty presence would have served political aims of Ming Dynasty power projection. And the tribute system, the political state of mutual gift exchange, in both state-sponsored and private trade were certainly important aspects. These voyages provided regular contact between China and other kingdoms and countries of ambassadors, merchants, and civilizations. One scholar commenting on the Ming Dynasty has stated that during the reign of Yongle, Chinese ships, Chinese sailors, and Chinese maritime technology dominated not only Asian waters, but also the Indian and Arabic sea lanes. Trade for Chinese products heading out and foreign goods heading in was exploited by the Chinese with economic bases set up in many of the same kingdoms ruling Southeast and South Asia at the time. In preparation for the sixth voyage of Zheng He in 1421, the Chinese emperor, quote, not only ordered Zheng He to take imperial orders together with brocade, gauze, thin satin, and other valuables as awards to the tributary states, but also provided his fleet with silver ingots, cotton cloth, copper coins, and other goods for trade activities in the Indian Ocean. The exporting of porcelain from the central country, China, was big. The importing of spices was bigger. It has been suggested that the profits from Zheng He's spice-centered trade generated a revenue for the Ming government that amounted to more than 10 times the total gains from foreign trade during both the Song and Yuan dynasties before it. The above is but a brief history of the maritime trade connecting Asia and the Middle East and Europe before the Europeans made their voice known in force. Fast forward to the turn of the 16th century and Vasco da Gama shows up after following the same trade routes in an easterly direction. Setting off from Portugal, he traced the new Portuguese routes down the west coast of Africa, around the feared Cape of Good Hope, which was formerly known as the Cape of Storms, and up to Madagascar and Mozambique along the southeast coast of Africa. From there, though, he, like Admiral Zheng He, was merely following the sea routes plied for centuries by maritime traders. The Gama hired an experienced foreign navigator to help guide him across the Indian Ocean. And in this, he unknowingly hearkened back to Admiral Zheng He as well, who also used foreign pilots and navigators during his voyages. The Portuguese quickly took control along the historic trade routes with violent efficiency. They established forts in Hormuz, Goa, and Malacca. How did the Portuguese and then other European merchants communicate with the civilizations they met in Asia, whether in India, Sumatra, or China? It was not easy. There were no dictionaries at the time, nor often even standardized languages within a single country. Europeans, especially the later Jesuits who we'll discuss, would eventually study Chinese and other local languages as the century passed. However, this option was not present at the beginning. Relying on others was one method used early during the time of contact. The existence of Chinese, Indian, and experienced Jewish and Muslim merchants in various ports helped, as they would have already picked up at least some degree of facility in the local language and could act as interpreters. As for Vasco da Gama's entry into Calicut itself, the first person to disembark, which was not da Gama, but rather a convict exile who he sent to test the waters, so to speak, he met a Tunisian Muslim who confronted him in Castilian or Genoese. The member of the Gama's crew responded in Portuguese, we come in search of Christians and spices. As the Europeans were soon to discover, Arabic was the recognized common tongue for maritime trade in Asia. In addition, words from one language were soon to be incorporated into others. For example, Persian and Arabic words became part of Chinese maritime vocabulary. Pidgin hybridizations full of jargon developed. Hand gestures and signs utilizing a common understanding of the sea and trade were likely employed then and are still employed today. 
The Europeans who arrived in Asia, though, they also employed a more direct practice of kidnapping local individuals, families, and groups to bring them back and train as interpreters. Language challenges were not the only roadblock to smooth communication and relations during the time of early contact. The Portuguese and many early Europeans after them were unfamiliar and not sensitive to Asian cultural, economic, and political mores and practices. One of the reasons the Gama's initial foray at Calicut was unsuccessful was that he did not bring appropriate gifts for the port, from the Portuguese court to the Calicut court. Merchants always brought gifts. Diplomatic embassies brought even better gifts. Gift exchange was a sign of respect and how things were done. De Gama had brought nothing. Searching his vessel for anything to offer once so informed, he came up with, quote, 12 pieces of striped cloth, six hats, four strings of coral, a case of sugar, two casks of oil, and two casks of honey. Not surprisingly, his hastily gathered package was rejected as insulting, and they did not get off on a good foot. Beyond language gaps and cultural misunderstandings, relations were also not aided by different frames of reference, attitudes, and prejudices. Two authors in the Asian department at the Victoria and Albert Museum have noted that, quote, Vasco da Gama entered the Arab-dominated Indian Ocean with anti-Islamic attitudes inherited from Portuguese centuries of struggle against Muslim occupiers of the Iberian Peninsula. While at Calicut, Gama refused the facilities of a Muslim interpreter, demanding instead an Arabic-speaking Christian. Religious animosities brought by the Europeans, combined with business and national suspicions, made contact and trade fraught with danger. This can be contrasted with a time before European contact, when the mix of merchants throughout Asia, Arabia, and beyond was generally characterized by smoother relations based on the common interest in trade. Examination of the 11th to 14th century Geniza merchant letters, which were discovered in an old Cairo synagogue, revealed that there was, quote, a remarkable cultural plurality observed and maintained by Jewish, Muslim, and Indian merchants, among whom little religious intolerance is recorded. After claiming position of power by force in Arabia and India, Malacca on the Malay Peninsula became the Portuguese base of operations for many years. Here they had contact with the Chinese who were regular traders in the port. The Portuguese gathered information about the country and people, about navigation to China, and about Chinese imports and exports. They learned that pepper was the king of Chinese imports, but also incense, elephant tusks, tin, beads, and aromatic wood were highly valued. Chinese exports included silk, sugar, and salt. After initiating trade with Southern China, and helping to tame rampant piracy that was terrorizing those local waters, the Portuguese secured their own beachhead just south of China during the first half of the 16th century. The Portuguese next settled here on Macau in 1557. Macau is a peninsula on the southern Chinese coast. It's about 90 miles southwest of Canton, now Guangzhou, and it's less than 40 miles of what is now Hong Kong, which is shown here on this 1888 map, Hong Kong on the lower right, and you can see Macau at the peninsula on the lower left. Relations during this time with China and the Chinese government were not always smooth, and military and diplomatic battles were not infrequent. From Macau, though, the Portuguese not only took control of foreign maritime commerce heading to and from China and Southeast Asia and the Indian Ocean, but they also acted as middlemen between the mostly closed China and the mostly closed Japan, for much of the balance of the 16th century, they were in control of trade. Macau also became the jumping off point and home base for Jesuits heading into and out of China. The Portuguese thus had a monopoly on this part of Asia during the 16th century, and as such, Lisbon became the center of European trade in Europe. The Portuguese, mighty though they were, were not often alone in Asia. Almost from the beginning, other European powers were breathing down their maritime necks. Around 1520, Ferdinand Magellan, a Portuguese sailor and the employee of the Spanish, made the first circumnavigation of the globe. Like Columbus, Magellan headed west, but he took the southern route and crossed into the Pacific Ocean near the southern end of South America. On this Teixeira map from 1573, South America is in the center. And so where Magellan came west, this way, the Pacific Ocean is the large 
water body on the left wrapping all the way around to the right. So this westerly route that Magellan started became how the Spanish built their trading and a colonial empire in Asia. Beginning in 1565, Spanish merchants and some missionaries crossed the Atlantic to Veracruz on the Mexican East Coast. They traveled overland 300 miles on the China road to Acapulco, and then they boarded galleons, bringing silver and crops to Manila in the Philippines. They did this because it was supposedly an easier way to get to Asia than around the Cape of Good Hope and across the Indian Ocean. Around 1580, Englishman Francis Drake made his own circumnavigation, and he too, like Magellan, went west to get east. His compatriot, Henry Hudson, also sailed west on behalf of the Dutch in the early 17th century. He was looking for the fabled Northwest Passage and a quicker route to Cathay. The Dutch, whose Dutch East India Company was founded in 1602, attained prominence in the 17th century after their independence from Spain. The British East India Company was founded in 1600, and it ultimately became powerful enough during the 18th century to topple governments and take over nations. The 16th to 18th century were a cutthroat time to be on the high seas. One man's pirate was another man's patriot. Today's ally might be tomorrow's enemy. Everyone was a competitor. Many might be spies. And rule number one was usually there were no rules. Land, shipping, inventory, all was fair game. Battles, bloodshed, and betrayal were the order of the day. Yet even so, spheres of influence did coalesce among the European players in Asia. The Portuguese maintained their base on Macau, just south of China. The Dutch consolidated the spice trade from what is now Indonesia and took advantage of the disruption of the collapsing Ming dynasty to capture the Jingdezhen export porcelain market in the early 17th century. They also had a base on Formosa, which is now Taiwan. As a result of this, the Dutch assumed a monopoly on Chinese porcelain from production in China to distribution in Europe. Meanwhile, the Spanish had colonized the Philippines into which they imported massive quantities of silver from their colonies in Central and South America. The British settled down in India with a focus on cotton textiles, indigo, chintzes, and later tea and opium. And the French, whose own French East India Company was not formed until decades later in 1664, gained prominence in what are now Vietnam, Cambodia, and Laos. What was it like to travel by sea from Europe to Asia during this time? Such journeys were brutal. They always took months and often took years. From storms to rocks to whirling eddies, from lack of winds to pirates to despair, from cramped quarters to poor food to lack of water, these were perilous voyages. Matteo Ripa, an Italian priest, spent 13 years in China serving as a painter and copper engraver at the Kangxi Emperor's court. His return trip from China to London in the early 18th century offers a chilling window into what travelers repeatedly undertook to get to and from Asia. These are Father Ripa's words from his memoirs as he accompanied five Chinese protégés back to Europe. They departed China on January 24, 3rd, 1724. On the night of the 10th of April, we had a tremendous storm. From the roaring of the sea and the winds, it seemed as though the vessel would be dashed into a thousand pieces at every moment. This was the first time in my life that I had seen a sea storm in all its terrific fury. Thanks to heaven, it did not last more than an hour. After this, the wind abated and was succeeded by a heavy rain which continued to fall without intermission until the whole crew was reduced to the greatest distress. Not only were their clothes completely soaked, but the water penetrated their chests and the cabins of the officers and injured a part of the cargo. I was more dead than alive, being afflicted as usual with a seasickness and feeling deeply forlorn for the for situation of my poor Chinese who were drenched with rain and benumbed with cold. The following is a mid 19th century account of a missionary's voyage to China, which demonstrates that travel had not approved much in the 130 plus years. Quote, Violent storms, seasickness, and unfavorable winds dogged and delayed their voyage. They were not to set foot on dry land for four months, landing in Singapore on September 5. While in Singapore, the aspiring and zealous missionary was delayed in his quest yet again, robbed by bandits who took everything he had. 
He spent the next two years trying to replenish his wardrobe and the necessary supplies for his mission in China. On October 15, a Portuguese vessel offered them passage north towards Hong Kong. However, the torrential rains and fierce winds of the monsoon forced them to return to Borneo and then head toward the Philippines in a voyage filled with storms and hurricanes. Their vessel finally anchored in the harbor of Macau on the evening of Christmas Day, 1852. Hong Kong lay only 60 kilometers away in the estuary of the Canton River, but it too was a dangerous undertaking, the area being infested with naval pirates. It took them another 12 hours to reach Hong Kong, the gateway to the Celestial Empire. All of the competition among the five principal European powers led to a combustible period of military, economic, and political intrigue as they battled for supremacy. The Chinese and the other Asian countries were often caught in the middle of this. The European ethos was dramatically different than what the traditional powers in Asia had seen before, particularly in execution. Both sides relied on trade as an integral component of relations. The Chinese, however, most often used the sea routes to spread and receive tribute and political influence without formally colonizing and directly controlling the host kingdoms. They established a strong presence, backed up by the military power or the threat thereof, from which to conduct business, promote the gift-giving essential to the tribute system, and conduct foreign affairs. The Europeans did not share the same mindset. They used the seas for military, political, and economic conquest. They were out to colonize and directly control these lands. The Shunzhu Emperor, who was the first Qing Emperor to rule over China proper, evidenced the Chinese point of view in a mandate he issued in 1656 concerning foreign trade when the Dutch came calling. Quote, the distance which divides Holland from China is so great that regular intercourse between the two countries is hardly practicable. Indeed, there is no record of any previous Dutch embassy. Aware of the long and arduous journey of the present ambassadors, we were happy to give them audience and receive their tribute presence. In earnest of our goodwill, we returned them gifts of suitable value. But when we think of the danger of storm and shipwreck that besets the passage hither, we are too solicitous of the welfare of the Dutch people to do more than permit them to send their ships to China once in eight years, what time they may sell four cargoes and bring presents to our court. Contrast this Chinese attitude with repeated Dutch and Portuguese embassies to Peking throughout the late 17th century and English embassies during the late 18th century and beyond. The Europeans presented themselves as at least equals, wanting to establish treaty relationships and a formalized diplomatic process. They demanded residency rights in the capital, lower tariffs, and more freedom of trade throughout the country. Each of these were repeatedly rebuffed by a Chinese power structure that did not see foreign nations and embassies as equals, and which had no desire for more contact with these outsiders. Maritime trade routes were the ancient highways carrying commodities, art, ideas, people, and religion between Europe and Asia. The impact of these connections was felt at both ends. Throughout Europe, importing Chinese wares became fashionable a sign of sophistication and culture, and imitating Chinese art and style soon exploded in its own right. By the middle of the 17th century, Chinese porcelain, lacquer, textiles, and tea were flooding the markets of Europe. The Dutch had taken over the porcelain export trade by this time and were commissioning pieces at the kilns of Jingdezhen with both Asian and European shapes and designs. This porcelain crockware bowl is from the Chongzhen period of the Ming Dynasty. One report has it that between 1602 and 1657, the Dutch East India Company sent 3 million pieces of Chinese porcelain to Europe. These pieces were transshipped first to their base in southern Formosa, and then through their base in Batavia, and finally onto Amsterdam for distribution throughout Europe. To protect the pieces in transit and multi multitask with limited space on board ship, the fragile porcelains were repacked, repacked in bags of pepper in Indonesia for the sea voyage to Europe. At the same time, imitation Chinese art in Europe for Europeans also took off in popularity throughout the 17th and 18th centuries. This chinoiserie developed with both imagined and derivative Chinese styles and designs. Pieces were not only Asian or only European. They were hybrids and amalgams, new concepts. 
Chinoiserie appeared assimilated in real lacquer and bamboo furniture. Architectural treatments, textile patterns, and on pottery, snuff boxes, and other project, for objects. The covered vases on the left in this slide are soft paste porcelain from Britain. And the unique peach shaped wine pot on the right is hard paste porcelain from Germany. Both are examples of the chinoiserie of the period. Ideas and people were also active parts of this cross knowledge train. Some travelers to Europe were converts to Christianity. This, after all, was the reason why the Jesuits and other religious denominations were flocking to China. Their efforts were mostly a failure, but not a complete one. One of their success stories was this man, Michael Shen, Shen Fuzong, a doctor's son and a Chinese convert who became a cause celeb in late 17th century Europe. Michael left China in 1681 to voyage to Europe in the company of his mentor. Flemish Jesuit Philippe Couplet. They were delayed a year in transit in Indonesia when they missed the last ship to sail west from Batavia near the end of the favorable wind season. When he finally arrived, Michael lit up European high society. He learned to speak Latin, Italian, and Portuguese. He met kings and popes, circulated among the elite, and was a bridge between East and West. He was painted by the royal portrait painter Godfrey Neller, shown here, while he was in London. He assisted in Jesuit translations of both a comprehensive history of China and the four famous Confucian texts, the Si Shu, into Latin. When Michael traveled to the Bodleian Library in Oxford in 1687, he helped to catalog several dozen Chinese books and manuscripts in the collection, and he served as a tutor, assisting Thomas Hyde, the keeper of the Bodleian Library. And at that time, Michael's history intersected with the unique piece of Asian maritime trade history. While Michael helped the keeper in learning Chinese and studying the basics of Buddhism and Taoism and Chinese inventions, he also assisted in translating the extensive Chinese labeling on this unique map of Southeast Asia, the, the Selden map. Named after its owner, who bequeathed it to the library, the Selden map is not as brightly illustrated as some of the others I showed, though it has in fact faded significantly over the centuries. But it is a distinctly maritime map that was produced in the early part of the 17th century. The approximately 400-year-old map looks remarkably conventional to our 21st century eyes, and it looks familiar because it was drawn from the perspective of the sea. The land masses were secondary. This was innovative for the time period. There are mistakes, exaggerations, and omissions, but it nonetheless remains a remarkably accurate depiction of the then shipping routes. Faint lines, which can't be seen here, but show up in, when enlarged, they, these faint lines chart the outbound sea routes from Chuenzhou in southern China to the South China Sea in Southeast Asia. The map is a combination hybrid of Chinese, European, and possibly Persian and West Asian elements. The latest scientific research on the map suggests that it was likely prepared by a Chinese cartographer from southern China living in either western Java or northern Sumatra, Indonesia. After leaving England, when in Lisbon, Michael studied to become the first Jesuit, Chinese Jesuit priest, but sadly, he never had the chance. While voyaging back to China around 1690, Michael died at sea somewhere between the Cape of Good Hope and Mozambique. The cultural impact of European maritime trade contact in China proper prior to the 19th century was also significant, but unlike in Europe where it spread throughout society, in China it was mostly limited to the enjoyment of the emperor and the imperial court. The principal drivers of this impact in China, beginning at the tail end of the Ming Dynasty and continuing during the first half of the Qing Dynasty, were Christian missionaries. Of these men, the Jesuits of the Society of Jesus are the most well-known. The Jesuits hailed from many countries in Europe. Two of the most famous were Italians, shown here, Matteo Ricci and Giuseppe Castiglioni. All of these European lay preachers and missionaries, Jesuit and other, brought scientific, mathematic, artistic, and other Western intellectual advances to China. Ricci, one of the first and most impactful, was, was a math whiz, among other talents. He also had a prodigious memory and spoke Latin, Greek, Portuguese, and Italian when he arrived in Macau. He learned the local dialect of Chinese while he was there on Macau, before ultimately moving to the mainland and learning the Chinese spoken by the official class there. The Chinese emperors learned much about the outside world from these missionaries who brought news and information about peoples, places, and foreign affairs. 
The arts of the early Qing Dynasty emperors reflect European influences in numerous ways. The Qianlong Emperor in the 18th century, in particular, employed European imagery, scenes, people, and design on artworks. Painted enamel was introduced to the Chinese court from Europe during the late 17th century. This wine ewer from the Palace Museum in Beijing is credited to an imperial workshop and dated to probably the late 18th century during the Qianlong reign. Each side contains a lobed cartouche that was created using enamel pigments on metal. As with much of Qianlong era art, the foreign innovation, painted enamel, was combined with local design, in this case, Chinese produced cloisonne. The lid is decorated with a coral finial, and the handle is in the shape of a Rui scepter. The base of the spout is a dragon's mouth. This snuff bottle is also a Qianlong era gilded copper and enamel bottle from the Thompson Collection at the Art Gallery of Ontario. The bottle is noted as being imperial from a Beijing workshop and not only utilizes the foreign introduced enamel, but also depicts two European ladies. Beginning in the late Ming Dynasty, foreign timepieces and clocks were appreciated and admired by the imperial court of both the Ming and Qing Dynasties. The Jesuits played a central role in servicing the mechanical clocks that were often made in Europe and sent as diplomatic gifts. Englishman James Cox, an 18th century London jeweler and clockmaker, made a number of elaborate and ornate automaton clocks for Asia, including for the Chinese imperial court. These are both Cox pieces. The left, which is now in the collection of the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York, is in the shape of a chariot pushed by a Chinese attendant. It was made in 1766 on commission by the British East India Company for the Qianlong Emperor. It was part of a paired set consisting of a gold case inlaid with gems. Springs drove the wheels of the chariot and levers controlled the whirly gig and birds being held up by the woman. The right clock on this slide is in the form of a bird cage and dates to circa 1800. The main columns of the cage are 12 pineapple trees and the top design rotated. Beginning in the late 17th century, the Kangxi emperor established in his son and grandson continued, a bureau of chiming clocks and a bureau of clock making in the imperial palace. This was dedicated to studying, producing, repairing, and conserving Western style mechanical clocks. And development of these clocks also became a local industry. The musical clock on the left side of this slide was made in the Guangzhou workshops in China during the later years of the Qianlong period. It has a gilt bronze body with paste set gems and an enamel clock with gilt hands. The clock face measures three and a half inches in diameter. The intricate design is a fusion of Western and Chinese design elements and includes four European figures in a vegetated top finial. The musical clock on the right, by contrast, is of the same period, but it was made in England. It is now part of the collection of the New Orleans Museum of Art. This gilt bronze clock also includes enamel and paste jewels. It is described as being made in the manner of James Cox. This clock was damaged during Hurricane Katrina, but has since been restored to not only once again keep time, but also to play a series of chime tunes and spin the jeweled ornaments. This is a hat stand from the Qianlong period. It's another example of the Western influence on 18th century Chinese art. This hat stand incorporates a gilt bronze elephant standing on a dark blue and white glass checkered base. The elephant wears a colored glass bead harness. A European gentleman in a frock coat kneels above the beast on a floral saddle. The man holds a tray above his head, upon which rests a metal vase adorned with glass and enamel decorations. Near the top are five gilt bronze Rui scepters set with semi-precious gems. At the very top is an engraved lidded box with a cover. European influence significantly impacted Chinese art and glassware as well. Killian Stumpf, a German Jesuit with a Portuguese mission, arrived in China in 1696. His voyage from Europe to Goa in 1691 saw ill winds, heavy storms, and death from diseases. While he was instrumental in China in many areas, including mathematics, astronomy, surveying, and calendar setting, Stumpf may be remembered most for establishing a famous glass factory in the imperial city west of the Forbidden City. His efforts led to a refinement in Chinese glassmaking, from telescope lenses to ruby red glass to vases, bowls, and bottles. There was a fusion of Western formulation and color, 
with Chinese design, decoration, and iconography that thrived during the 18th century. The glassmaker who crafted this cup used European diamond point engraving to carve the flowers of the four seasons on the side panels. I found an interesting reference that this cup might be and might fit the description of glass cups that were sent to the King of Portugal by the Kangxi Emperor in 1722, specifically, quote, eight small cups with flower pattern, the color of blue sky after rain. I would like to conclude with a discussion of another map, which is important for many reasons, including to the era of maritime trade contacts between China and the West. This is the wall size six panel woodblock print map of the world that Matteo Ricci prepared in 1602. It is entitled, The Complete Geographic Map of 10,000 Countries. Ricci prepared this third version of his map at the command of the Ming Dynasty Wanli Emperor. And it was originally to be mounted on six large folding screens. Ritchie worked in collaboration with Chinese scholars, and this map is thus the first map that is a blend of both Western and Eastern cartography. With a nod to the culture of the host country, China is positioned at the center of the world layout, and it's on the third panel from the left as you're looking at the slide. This map is not only the largest woodblock print map ever printed, but it is the oldest surviving map in China to show the Americas which it does with pretty decent accuracy for the time. Along the right-hand side, you, on the fifth and then sixth panel, you can see North America come down to Central America and then South America. One researcher has noted that the Ricci map is, quote, an ambassador to China of Western Europe and of the Jesuit order, an encyclopedia and a work of art. From a technical perspective, the detail carved into the pear wood blocks is intricate. From an information perspective, the map explodes with an almost overwhelming amount of knowledge, illustrations, and extensive Chinese prefaces and commentary that surround the edges and are interwoven throughout the map. At one point, there were more than 2,000 authorized copies of the Ritchie map and an untold number of unauthorized copies. Only six survive. This slide is of one of the two remaining good condition originals of the map. The James Ford Bell Trust purchased this map in 2009 for $1 million, and it is now in the Minneapolis Institute of Art. The information presented on this map explores countries and regions far and wide. It comments on the habits and customs of other people and places. There are discussions shown here of mathematical and scientific concepts, of celestial and astronomical phenomena, of time zones and seasons, and of hemispheres, geography, and natural history. Ritchie includes statements on the religion of Europe, but he does so in a manner that is non-threatening and with a goal of being culturally relatable to the Chinese. One commentator has stated that the map is, quote, part homage and part diplomatic, an affirmation of not only the greatness of China, but also of Ritchie's Western culture and religion. Looking at North America here, Florida, and if you can see my cursor. Florida is shown uh, about the middle right of the map. It is labeled as the land of flowers. If you come up to what is the U.S. coast and it uh, goes to the right, there is a reference to a dog river that is just north of where New York is. On another part of the map, which you can't see here near Alaska, there is a statement in Chinese that says, this land used to be connected to the mainland of Asia, but now is not. Around the main body of the United States, there is a description of humped oxen and, quote, cows that have saddle-shaped flesh on their backs like camels, which must be references to bison. Describing the region along the western seaboard of North America from Canada down through the land of flowers, Ricci writes that the people are good and pure. When foreigners come, they are well treated. They wear skins for clothing and fish for a living. The people in the mountains kill each other, fight and plunder throughout the year. All they eat is snakes, ants, spiders and other bugs. This map is a jewel and Ricci knew it. He wrote in his diary, they quote, with this map, a gentleman could travel the world without leaving his study. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Andrew. Very, uh, uh, very fascinating uh, lecture. Um, and I appreciate you taking the time to talk to us. Can you hear us? I'm not sure if you he can hear us. 
Can you hear me? Yeah, I can hear you, yes. but can you hear can you hear us? Yes, I can yes, I okay. hear you. Excellent. Okay. I'm gonna turn you. it over to John. Uh he's got a couple of questions. Before I do that, uh I'd like to ask you myself, um, what was your inspiration for this type of uh Chinese history? Uh you, you mean for my studying of it? Yes. Um I, I've always been interested in, in China in history. I uh, that was my A of an Asian Studies degree from college, and then I am a member of the uh, International Chinese Snuff Bottle Society. I'm a collector of snuff bottles, and uh, a year or so ago, um, uh, they asked me to look into doing um, a lecture, and and this topic interested me and interested me and fascinated me, and I started doing the research at that time. Excellent. Well, thank you very much. And John, go ahead and ask him a couple of questions. Yeah. So we have two questions from the audience. One saying, can you recommend some museum collections have particularly strong collections of the material that you showed? I know it's it's not close, but I know that the uh, Victoria Museum in London has a, a very good um, uh, collection. Uh, the uh, Metropolitan in New York also has uh, many, many materials. Um, unfortunately, as with most large museums, they have so much that most of it is not on display at any one time. Uh, however, um, uh, those would be two. And the, the MFA in Boston also has uh, great material. And the Peabody Essex Museum in Salem, which was, uh, you know, a seafaring you know, museum and has, has terrific uh, Asian art uh, in its collection. That's great. We have a few items in our collection too that we are hoping to display next summer in our weird, wacky, and wonderful show. Uh, <laughs> That'd be great. Yeah. So we'll have to we'll have to come and visit. The next question is bringing it back here to New England. It says, "What role did ships out of New England, Boston, Cape Cod, play in the China trade?" The they were later. Uh, because uh, you know, when New England ships started uh, venturing was really not until the first ship that left from uh, New, well, it wasn't New England, it was New York um, and, and Philadelphia. Um, they the first ship left in 1784 to travel to China, and that um, inaugurated the um, American ships joining the China trade. Um, and uh, ships, I do not no specific ships specific from Cape Cod. Um, I know certainly obviously with the whaling fleets, they were, they were traveling far and wide, but the American ships did begin sailing out of at least New York and Philadelphia um, late 18th, early 19th century. And this is a question I have, or maybe like an argument. Would you say that Sheen Wazari is perhaps an example of the first international style that, you know, Western and Eastern are kind of influencing each other, and it's kind of the first homogenous culture kind of put up forth. I I would say it is one of them, certainly for Europe. But interestingly, um, I think there was some of that going on in southern China in the uh, research that Professor Hansen has done about Quanzhou. They talk about how some of those foreign products that were coming in were adapted for local customs and tastes. So I don't mm. think it was necessarily artistic the way Chinoiserie was, but I think mm. they were also probably adapting some of the foreign products. Uh, but definitely in Europe, it, it took off in popularity and success. And um, what, you collect snuff bottles. What is snuff? Is it tobacco? Is it other substances? What would typically be in a snuff bottle? Um, snuff was the basis of snuff is tobacco. Tobacco was introduced uh, from Europe by way of Brazil into southern China by uh, the merchant traders and the Jesuits in the uh, you know beginning early Qing dynasty, late Ming, early Qing dynasty mostly. And um, the tobacco was ground up, and they added spices and different flavorings to it. Um, they originally snuff was seen as being medicinal. And so they they didn't smoke. They didn't. Uh, they never had a tradition of smoking then. But they did, sn you know, snort the snuff. Um, originally, it was limited to the imperial, um, you know, imperial class. Eventually, it did spread throughout China. Uh, but it is a mixture. It's a fine powder, which is based from tobacco and other spices. Interesting. 
um, I think people have different connotations of what, what it is. Um, hey, Andrew, was, this, was snuff more for used with by women or was it both men and women used it? Um, originally, I believe it was it was not by women, it was by the imperial court. So it was mostly okay. by um, you know the men, um, uh, the princes, the the other members of the court. Um, and, and again, they they originally you know had thought of it as a it had medicinal benefits, which is one of the reasons they did it. Um, at some point, it also spread you know for, to women and then to others. Interestingly, from the snuff bottle point of view, snuff bottles quickly became an art form in themselves, and many of them never necessarily were snuff containers. They were made as art forms because they were small. They fit in your palm mostly. They became excellent gifts. Um, and they were able to reproduce landscapes and other art forms that the Chinese treasure in miniature form. And so uh, the snuff bottles really became more important than the snuff over time. Very interesting. And what effect did it have on the body? Was it a euphoric? Was it um, energizing? My understanding is that it was a little bit of it was energizing and that they at that time thought that it could help keep um, maladies at bay, certain mm -hmm. maladies at bay. I'm not sure which ones. Well, thank you, Andrew. I think we've come and hit our time. Kevin, I'll let you sign yeah, us Andrew, off. Thank you very much. And uh, thank you for everybody who attended today's uh, this evening's lecture. And uh, I greatly appreciate you. Uh, uh, informing us about this uh, very fascinating subject. So thank you so much. And everybody, thank you and have a wonderful evening. Thank you. Great being here. Good night.